Welcome back and thank you for joining us for Two Steps Forward, our daily Bible study. We are all the way up to kind of a pinnacle chapter in Exodus. It's one of the last big narrative chapters, Exodus 32, and this is episode 118 for us. Exodus, though, ex Exodus 32, mm -hmm. uh, chapter 32 is the one we've alluded to a number of times, the famous golden calf incident. Anything you want to oh. touch on before we get here? I just want to show my... Oh, go ahead. So someone made That's us... That's the back. Yeah, I know it's a reveal. Oh. Someone made us this beautiful artwork for our... <clears throat> Not someone. Who is the someone? Yeah, Coach. Coach Lance Meyer um, has... And this down here is supposed to be the serpent representing Genesis 3, because that was like one of my like big aha moments of faith that I talked about in our Bible study. These are James's feet. At, feet. They look like Sasquatch's feet, <laughs> but I was wearing shoes and he traced kind of around the shoes, not like tightly around the shoes. And then the red down here is supposed to represent like Christ's sacrifice. Oh, that's what it was. It was, I will strike the heel, strike yeah, his the, heel. The serpent striking the heel of Christ, the, the uh -huh. offspring of the woman. I don't want to explain it anymore because I feel like I might not do the interpretation justice. Well, so the blood, the red is the blood that once it strikes the heel, so you can see the, the red in the portrait is on, or the picture is on the heel. So the serpent has struck, uh, the, um, the blood has poured out. The green is symbolic of life and the abundance of God's grace and life that he pours into us. And um, so in two steps forward, this is the growing concept. The more we oh, yeah, the green's at the top because you're going forward. Yes, the more we focus on Christ, the more uh, we continue to grow. Uh, the more we focus on what Christ has done for us and conquering sin for us, the more we grow in our sanctification and that gives us, uh, creates new life in us. Yes. So all that, Lance's has this brilliant creative mind. He. Um, did a lot of uh, urban uh, alumni ministry for mm -hmm. our school, like teen ministry. Uh, this past year, he um, has suffered from something called Hashimoto's disease. And Hashimoto's encephalopathy, I mm -hmm. think is what it's called, but it attacks your thyroid and created all sorts of problems with energy levels and, and that sort of thing. But it hasn't hindered his faith and hasn't hindered his artistic ability. And he's channeling a lot of those efforts into... Um, doing artwork that uh, any funds that he raises from the artwork is going back into urban ministry a lot of the urban ministry that he himself was mm -hmm. doing and so if you're interested he had a kind of an art fair at our yeah he had an art show in yesterday our, in our atrium at our our church and I got some a beautiful picture portrait of Jesus I wish I had it to show you some of you might have gifts coming your way uh, regarding this art but if you'd like to purchase some for your own um, just reach out to me or comment below and I'll make sure to connect you with Lance. He has uh, several hundred original works that he's put together now, all incredibly thoughtful and uh, it's, it's Lance's brain and Lance's faith mm -hmm. just poured out on, on canvas and uh, really cool stuff. He'll frame it for you like that, all that good stuff. So, yeah. So thank you, Coach Meyer. Yes, for thank you, Coach Meyer, for that great work. And something that is like, so for us now, uh, an icon of what we're doing. We'll mm -hmm. be able to hold on to that forever and, you know, kind yeah. of a cool reminder of this period in our life and doing this. Um, but again, big chapter, one of the most, one of the biggest chapters, if not the biggest in Exodus is Exodus 32. That's what we're up to today. The golden calf incident, the Israelites have been freed, delivered, from slavery in Egypt, they've passed miraculously through not just the plagues, but the waters of the Red Sea. They've wandered through the wilderness, but been miraculously provided for every day. Um, God has given them manna in the morning, quail in the evening. They're fully provided for, even though they don't know exactly where they're going, they know eventually they'll get to the promised land. That's mm -hmm. the end game, that's the goal. We said all of this is a reminder of, uh, it, it's, a, it's a metaphor for the believer's life freed from the slavery of sin, passing through the waters of baptism, walking through the wilderness of life, God miraculously, uh, provisionally um, taking care of us every day, uh, knowing eventually we're getting to the promised land, but we're not there yet. And something that is painfully similar to our lives is what we find here today, the struggle with idolatry. Um, just real quick before you read your summary, can you tell me how long this happens after they come out of Egypt. 
Yeah. So I, I don't know the exact dating, but it's a matter of months. Months. Okay. Yes. It's not years. It's months. Okay. So eventually, yeah, I, I won't get into spill into anymore, but yeah, correct. Because we don't have like, obviously they're not counting in BC right now where we mm -hmm. always approximate things. And so we know they're somewhere around 1450 BC, um, in the, or what we would call the calendar. But yes, they've only been, this is only a matter of months later. And how many, how long is it after Moses first got the 10 commandments? Like day, weeks? He, so remember he's been up on the mountain for 40 days okay. and 40 nights and they get impatient while he's up there mm -hmm. receiving God's law. We've already, so at the beginning of Exodus 20, we went through that whole piece where they said, we will yeah. obey everything that you command mm -hmm. us. Moses gets, uh, receives the the law and they say yes everything that is there we will obey that mm -hmm. Moses is back up because he goes up on the mountain on several occasions to communicate with God but he's been up there for a while now mm -hmm. 40 days and, and 40 nights yeah and they immediately start doing the very things that they just committed to not doing is that why Jesus had to go to the wilderness for 40 days and nights correct oh yep it is the um, well, 40, 40 is a unique number in the Bible that is represents some kind of totality and completeness. Mm -hmm. But yeah, Jesus is perfectly sufficient and complete in his obedience to God, mm -hmm. even in the wilderness of life. Good. Yeah. So good connection. Um, so here we are. Exodus 32. Make sure to read through your copy at home. Here's my personal paraphrase. Uh, since Moses was up on the mountain for a while, the people, God's people, the Israelites, became restless. They went to Aaron and demanded that they make that he make uh, new gods to lead them. Aaron asked for all the jewelry that they'd been given when they came out of Egypt, and he melted it and fashioned it into a golden calf. Uh, they then informed the Israelites that their this was their new god. <laughs> Aaron saw, now we'll talk about exactly the golden calf thing. Why? That, so, that seemed so silly to me as a kid. Like, what What on earth is this? They have them outside, um, cops. Cops frozen yogurt. Yes, looks like, I cannot help but think that that looks like a pagan temple every yeah. time I drive by that place. I think it just has to do with, like, creamery kind of thing. But, um, I don't know. Uh, Aaron saw how excited the people were about it and said that they would sacrifice the next morning to the Lord. So there's also some debate mm -hmm. regarding whether or not Aaron is saying this is a representation of the Lord or this is a brand new God or how Aaron is justifying this in his own mind. But the people had begun already to indulge in wicked worship, likely with drinks and promiscuous sexuality and all mm -hmm. that stuff, the, the promiscuity of pagan worship that they saw back in Egypt. The Lord informed Moses, who was up at the, on the mountain at this time, what the Israelites were doing. God was going to destroy them and start over with Moses and a new group of people. But Moses sought God's grace upon them. He asked God to turn from his anger and remember his unwavering faithfulness to his ancestors. And God said, okay, I will relent. Moses then went down the mountain with the stone tablets of the law. He heard the people partying. When he saw what they were doing, he was so angry that he smashed the tablets of the law. He saw the, the them dancing around the calf. He burned the calf down to the ground, uh, ground it into powder from the ashes, and made the people drink the water, probably getting sick from this. Moses confronted Aaron, but Aaron tried to blame the people and say, it wasn't my fault. So Moses said, whoever is for the Lord, come with me. And the Levites all came, and he commanded them the message the Lord had given them. Uh, go through the camp and kill everyone that comes in your way with the sword, even uh, family members if it needs be. The Levites did so and 3,000 people were killed that day. This was to prove their allegiance to the Lord ahead of anything else. And as a result, the Levites became God's chosen tribe to watch over the coming, the tabernacle and eventually the temple. The next day, Moses again reminded the people of their great sin. And he said he was going to consult God and beg for their mercy. God says that he will still punish the Israelites for sin when necessary, but that Moses should go and God's angel will go before them. The Lord struck the people, um, which we'll get to eventually who this angel is this time now, but the Lord struck the people with a plague, so all of them um, would receive some kind of punishment. So there's 3,000 that died, all of them got physically sick, and then there was this accompanying plague so that they were reminded this is a result of their wickedness. And that's my summary for Exodus 32. Mm -hmm. Any initial feedback from that? No, there's a lot of things. I, um, 
The punishment seems a little severe, but I kind of like it. When he made them drink the cap. That seems so. I, it does. I here, mean, it just seems I, unusual, I guess. Yeah, and the thing is, I think you're probably. I think a lot of people would probably articulate that. And from, for me to play kind of defense of God's actions here, I would say, why is okay? You have these people that you've done so much for. Mm -hmm. You chose them by grace. You delivered them by grace. You provided for them daily. You've you've gone out of your way every day to take care of them. The moment they don't see your presence for a matter of a couple weeks, mm -hmm. they immediately start worshiping former gods, like worshiping former gods. So, like this is God talks about Israel's idolatry as prom like unfaithfulness, mm -hmm. cheating on him, um, mm -hmm. infidelity, and so. But so you're saying the punishment seems severe if somebody like if somebody cheated on their spouse. Mm -hmm. Like it's like, well, what should the punishment for that be? Shouldn't it be that's a serious crime? Uh, Israel, as God's people, have cheated on him. Mm -hmm. What should be the right response? You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, you to you, it seems cruel and unusual, though. No, I didn't say that. I just said it. Like it just kind of made me laugh when I read it. Yeah, like you wrote it down. And you made them drink it. It is poetic, and that's going to be part of one of the first points that I get to here. So let's just jump into the first devotional thought. We'll call it idolatry or syncretism, and I know that's one of those big words we never use, but syncretism is the idea of combining different worship practices, like different uh, people today who, when you live in a pluralistic society, it's very tempting to grab. I like this idea from this religion mm -hmm. and this idea from this religion. Remember, ancient societies were mostly polytheistic and therefore somewhat pluralistic, and they might borrow different concepts from different gods, and the Israelites are constantly tempted to this. It's not that they just completely give up on Yahweh, it's that they see appealing aspects to other gods, mm -hmm. want it to be true. So like that God allows us to have sexual promiscuity while we worship. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's maybe we do believe that's a real God kind mm -hmm. of thing, and then they you know absorb that. So what are the Israelites doing here? Is it just overt idolatry? Are they adding um, other elements of other pagan worship to uh, the worship of the true God? Essentially what they do, and again, so I mentioned this, going back to this is one of those childhood Sunday school lessons mm -hmm. and coloring sheets, and it's like, okay, we're gonna, they're worshiping a, a golden calf. Why? Mm -hmm. I knew gold meant money, mm -hmm. right? Um, it probably, most scholars will say there's a correlation between this bull god and the god that they knew, one of the gods that they knew in Egypt named Apis. And in the ancient Near East, a bull was a symbol of power and fertility. Mm -hmm. So for obvious reasons, probably, uh, a, an, an oxen was. Mm -hmm. And so uh, they, if you wanted to be powerful as a nation and fertile and reproduce as a nation, you might worship this specific god as one option mm -hmm. and so that seems to be what they're after they remembered how much they enjoyed the worship practice of the Egyptians with Apis mm -hmm. and they decided okay that's a god that we want to worship um, how how is Aaron justifying this yeah. like what do you think he's going think what's going he, through his mind so I think that it's him against like two million people mm -hmm. and he's just giving his kid a bag of chips in church to peer pressure them. yeah so that they don't do something worse mm -hmm. or like do something against him yeah yep he's he's in other words it's not in it doesn't seem like it's initially his idea, even though he drives some of this in fashion. Well, I think that's why he says we'll worship the Lord, because he's yeah. trying to appease them and still appease God. Right. I think that's my suspicion, too, is that he's trying to justify, like, hedges bets mm -hmm. and say, okay, I'm going to please these people, but I'm also going to serve. Now, Aaron knew full well, like the commandments, you shall have no other gods, and you shall not make any graven images to mm -hmm. God. So even if in his mind he thought... Um, this bull is a representation of the true God Yahweh. He knows the commandment. You're not supposed to make an image to of him. Mm -hmm. So even if it, like, my point is, even if it's not a different God, even if it's the same God, it's the wrong practice mm -hmm. that he just agreed. Yeah, I won't commit that sin. So any way you slice it, Aaron is not justified in his actions, and yet I think that is the exact justification that's going through Aaron's head at this point. Okay, these are more, they outnumber me, what am I supposed to do? Mm -hmm. um, I'm put in a compromised position, I will tell them that this is the Lord, so they're still kind of worshiping the Lord, and yet they will be satisfied because they get to do what mm -hmm. they want to do in their worship practices. 
So you know how you're saying he knows the Ten Commandments. Do you think people, to, do you think kids today still learn the Ten Commandments? Um, this is one of the, I mean, I knew, I know that I spent a lot of time and energy memorizing the commandments and Luther's explanation of the commandments as a kid in Christian education. Well, I guess I have a friend who is 15, 13 years younger than me. Um, and she said when she was little, her dad would never explain why. If you told her to do something and she complained about it, she, he would never explain why he wanted her to do it. He would just make her recite both the Ten Commandment and Luther's explan or the Fourth Commandment and Luther's explanation of the Fourth Commandment. Yeah. And I was like, I actually kind of love that because I don't think a kid needs to know why all the time. Honor your father and mother. And secondly, yeah. that that she was that she had learned could recite the explanation yeah. that that was pretty impressive yeah that i mean there is a parenting technique in there somewhere between like if you just say because i'm the father that's why or i'm the mother that's why like at some point kids are going to get frustrated by that because mm -hmm. kids do require some amount of explanation and yet there's sometimes certain things that kids can't process and they don't mm -hmm. like even if you do explain it to them really well they're not going to get it and therefore, they don't obey because it makes sense to them. They obey because this is my mom and dad that God gave to me. Mm -hmm. So, but yeah, it's interesting. I don't know exactly how I feel about parents leveraging that in their parenting. <laughs> like, I like it. But yeah, it's it's interesting, and it's nonetheless helpful for kids to mm -hmm. like. I I remember the explanations to all those commandments, and they're really. I mean, we've talked about. Luther's explanation to the Eighth Commandment, take your neighbor's words and actions in the kindest possible way, mm -hmm. and how helpful that is in in practically applying God's command about, you know, the way you speak about one another. Mm -hmm. So, um, but for here, uh, it's probably, so that, that idea of syncretism that I brought up earlier, mm -hmm. all I want you to see is, so even though we probably, like everybody, if you're in the 21st century, you think bowing down to a golden calf is silly, whether you're Christian or not. Mm -hmm. You know, it looks stupid um, to us culturally. But that's because overt idolatry in general looks silly to us. Subtle idolatry is just as prevalent today as it's ever been. And for that matter, the idea of syncretism in idolatry, the idea that we would serve the true God, but also then bring in other value systems and try to meld the two together. Mm -hmm. So like how often do you hear Christians speaking, just to throw out a couple examples uh, of the concept of like karma, you know, what goes around comes around yeah. kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Karma is an Eastern religious concept. We don't operate with God according to karma. We operate with God according to grace. Mm -hmm. And actually, if you let it slip into your mind too much, it gets you to think that God is a God of like meritocracy that he blesses those who simply do well mm -hmm. kind of thing and so like a, being able to discern what is not christian what mm -hmm. is not the true god from what is that slips into our cultural practice hyper individualism we've talked about before that is very clearly a belief in our current era now nobody would say it's religious it's philosophical and it's post enlightenment western civilization but it absolutely is part of a belief system that is not um congruent with what God's will is for his people. Mm -hmm. Secular humanism, the idea that humans are the pinnacle of everything and through our own rational powers we can figure the world out. Uh, no. Postmodern relativism, the idea that all morals and values are simply what I decide that they are for me and you decide what they are for you and we'll just not interrupt one another. And my point is, like you can go down the line and Christians are constantly, without even realizing it, just like the Israelites didn't realize it, mm -hmm. are being tempted to incorporate other belief systems and worship practices into the worship of the true God. And they're doing it and they don't even realize how silly it is and how, how um, it's cheating on God in a way, mm -hmm. like the seriousness of it. So, um, yeah, we struggle with the same kind of idolatry and syncretism still today. Devotional thought number two. Moses intercedes and God relents. This is interesting and is another one of those. It's kind of like Abraham praying for Sodom mm -hmm. and kind of, <clears throat> you know, bartering Sorry. God down on the number of uh, righteous people in Sodom. Yeah, we see God being affected by Abraham or by Moses' prayers and intercession here on top of Mount Sinai. God tells Moses, "Here's what the Israelites are doing. I'm really angry about it." These are a stubborn, stiff-necked people, and I'm about done with them. And I think I might just destroy them, and I'm going to start over with you mm -hmm. and, you know, your, whatever people you produce. 
And Moses at that point does something really interesting. This is around like verses, he intercedes in verses 11 to 14. And then again, at the end at verses 31 through 32, but he, he does, he says three things to God. He says, number one, you spent so much time and energy calling them out of Egypt. So you've mm-hmm. already invested a lot in them. Why would you give up on them now? Mm-hmm. Number two, he says, if the Egyptians find out that you brought them all the way out here only to get fed up with them and destroy them, mm-hmm. they're going to mock your name. Mm-hmm. This is what Moses is saying to God. And number three, Moses says, God, don't forget the promises of grace that you gave to the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, mm-hmm. and Jacob. And so like you've promised to them that you'll be patient with them and bring them to a certain you know place and, and all that and make sure that you're fulfilling your promises to them. And God seemingly changes his course of action at that point because Moses presents like a really mm-hmm. good argument. And it's not that it's like it's a revelation to God, but what we find here is that Moses, he actually goes even one step further and he says, if you're going to destroy these people, destroy me too. Mm-hmm. Because Moses so clearly identifies with his people that if they would face harm, he would rather be harmed in place of them or mm-hmm. with them. And what we then find here is Moses very clearly serves as a, remember that special word we use in the Old Testament for mm-hmm. foreshadowings? The type he, of Christ. He's a type of Christ. Like very clearly when you read that as a New Testament believer, you're supposed to see, wait a second, this guy who's acting on behalf of his people who are stubborn and don't deserve God's grace, he's interceding for them and actually willing to take a fall for them. Now, Moses doesn't take a fall, and that's why Jesus is the greater Moses. But remember, we know it's a type of Christ. We know he's a type of Christ because Moses even prophesies at one point in Exodus, um, after me, one will come. Uh, God will raise up for you a prophet who is greater than me kind of thing from among your own people. Mm-hmm. So uh, just to make sure that you're const- we're constantly seeing, reading scripture through the lens of Jesus Christ mm-hmm. and everything in Old Testament points ahead and everything in the New Testament is an extrapolation of what has been in Christ. I uh, want to make sure that everybody sees Moses as the intercessor mm-hmm. and God relenting on behalf of his intercession. I think my Bible explained it really well. It says God didn't because it's interesting, like, oh, you can change God's mind. It says God didn't actually change his mind. Like, God was just, um, he was being consistent with his character in either situation. Like, he was being consistent in his justice, in his holiness, and then he was being consistent in his mercy. Mm-hmm. So, like, he didn't actually change his mind. I think you said course of action. Like, he maybe yeah. changed his course of action, um, to, re- but he completely remained consistent with his nature, throughout the entire thing. Yes. Yeah, it's it's a really kind of tricky distinction whenever we think about God. So anytime you run into that word, like God relents, uh-huh. like, wait a second, what does that mean? Yeah. He's backing off. Does that mean, you know, mm-hmm. somebody presented such a great argument? Does that mean that he, like he regretted what he did before? Because mm-hmm. even that word is used in translations. He regret, mm-hmm. I regret, you know, creating them or, or whatever. Mm-hmm. And so I think that's probably a good explanation. It's not that God did anything wrong, and it's not that he should have done differently. Mm -hmm. It's that he's acting, being sensitive to his children, Mm -hmm. but acting in line with his character. Um, You know, which also goes hand in hand with, going back to my comment about like, um, oh, I think I like Jesus more than like God. I remember the comment. So someone commented on the, in the YouTube comments and said, I really don't enjoy reading um, about like all of the law, Old Testament laws, right. I have a really hard time reconciling who I know of God with the way God is portrayed in Exodus. And I mean, obviously, I understand that argument because I said something similar. Um, but the explanation, or in my book, it says, um, or my Bible, it says many people think the God of the Old Testament is a God of wrath, only to be feared. But God reveals words to Moses. When Moses, it's actually the next chapter, I think, but Moses asks to see God's glory and God instead shows him his love yeah. because that is where his glory dwells. And it says, don't, it says, don't accept anyone's argument that the God of the Old Testament is merely vengeful. In fact, he is slow to anger and merciful to his children. And this is just an example of that, I think. Like, you're right, he would have had every justifiable reason to, I mean, he can yeah. do whatever he wants. If he wants to start over with Moses, that's fine. Yeah. If- but the fact that he didn't, yeah, right. I think that's the, I mean, in my mind, so I've counseled a lot of couples through like marital infidelity kind of thing. 
And um, we know full well from scripture that if somebody, one of the partner or the other is unfaithful, that is mm -hmm. grounds for divorce. Mm -hmm. It's entirely possible. There is, however, something beautiful and gracious when, even when there has been infidelity, mm -hmm. that the marriage partner who has been offended nonetheless forgives and reconciles. And I think uh, going back to this analogy of, of Israel as God's bride mm -hmm. and she's been unfaithful to him. And he's like, like if, if he didn't consider getting rid of her, I don't think you could say he ever loved her that much in the first place. Because he, if he wasn't hurt at all when your spouse cheats on you, mm -hmm. like how much do you actually love them? But the fact that he is willing to, like th considering starting over and moving on, but nonetheless stops and reconciles and says, I'm hurt by this. Mm -hmm. And he's going to explain in the next chapter how he's hurt and what that means. Um, but the fact that he doesn't give up on her and he reconciles to her is, uh, to me, all the product of his love. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I'm glad you, you highlighted that comment because I'm sure that's that person's probably speaking for a number of people who read through Exodus. Mm -hmm. and, um, it, it doesn't, it, it's a different image of God or God from a different angle. Yeah. But the holiness and love go together in perfect harmony, but in ways that we might not define by ourselves from our own fallen hearts also says like we have a hard time comprehending god as he really is apart from jesus christ yeah so this is kind of god i don't want to say like without the son but it's a, i guess a different person of the trinity yeah if if you're looking at god and not looking through the lens of jesus mm -hmm. christ i think you would get a harder mm -hmm. view of him and it's a god we're not really as familiar with like i don't know what he looks like yeah. I know what Jesus looks like because Coach we have Meyer drew, him, drew him yeah. for me. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yes. it's So it's the, diff the difference between, we mentioned this in Genesis, the God of the Old Testament that is, shows himself in consuming fire mm -hmm. that like you can't even go near. Mm -hmm. Like Moses, take, or yeah, take your shoes off. Like you're on holy ground. Get out of here. You're going to get destroyed. Um, and we see that repeatedly, like this cons all consuming fire, the Israelites don't even want to totally get approach the mountain mm -hmm. type of thing. And there's a, you know, but in the New Testament, he comes in the form of a baby, you know, so he's wrapped in flesh and mm -hmm. in flesh that you could actually hold in your own arms. And it just shows God is presenting himself in a, an approachable way, um, that he hadn't before. And it was always the same God, mm -hmm. but he has to establish his holiness first that mm -hmm. he's a holy god and like it's the difference between the law and the gospel mm -hmm. the law has you have to be aware of your sin before you recognize that you're in need yeah. of saving and that's kind of the even though there's both law and gospel in the old and new testaments that's kind of the progression of how god reveals himself mm -hmm. uh last point third devotional th uh, thought sickness and slaughter is what we'll call it um the, the I'm just going to use the phrase, you always will eventually become sick on the idols that you worship. And there is a very obvious example of it here in um, Moses takes the idol literally, mm -hmm. grounds it down and forces them to drink it yeah. and they become sick on it. And that is symbolic of all idolatry. Like if you elevate anything ahead of God, mm -hmm. so we've talked about this before. Um, let's say your your child becomes an idol to you. You elevate that child to the most important thing in the world ahead of ahead of God even. Mm -hmm. Like the, you get all your identity, all your meaning, all your security, all your hope and purpose and drive and joy in life out of that child mm -hmm. ahead of God. Okay, well if you treat a little child as a God, like an idol, uh, what's eventually going to happen? You're never going to discipline the child because you can't I stand the idea of your little child cursing you and getting mad at you for disciplining the child. And what happens if you don't discipline a child? They grow up to become a monster. Mm -hmm. And when they grow up to become a monster and everybody else doesn't treat them like they're a little god, uh, they're not going to be able to navigate society. When they can't navigate society, who are they ultimately going to hate for not being not teaching them how to navigate society? Their parent, mm -hmm. right? So in the same in the one same idolatrous move of worship, you eventually are alienating, you're, you're ruining your relationship with your child and you're ruining your relationship with God. Mm -hmm. And so you've become sick on the idol that you're worshiping. You know, it's made you ill long term. That's just obviously one example, but that's the same thing. This is, this is very clearly a metaphor for what happens when you idolatrous, uh, I, worship in idolatry. Mm -hmm. It makes you sick. Um, it Sometimes, in fact, it even kills you. 
And that metaphor is also in here too, because we find out, you know, Moses comes down and he asks, okay, he asks this, you know, who's for the Lord kind of thing. And the Levites come forward and he has them take the sword and go and, and it's, we don't know exactly all the details of it, but what we do know ends up happening is 3,000 of the Israelites died that day as a result of their idolatry. And all of Israel receives a plague as a result of this idolatry. So it doesn't say what it is. No, um, you know whether or not it's related to the drinking of the gold powder or not. We we don't. It was food poisoning, which is terrible. <laughs> it was yeah. You food want poisoning is is pretty terrible. You feel like you're dying. Um, and I think so. Again, it's this idea that in God's grace, He forgives our sins. Like He takes away the eternal consequence mm-hmm. of those sins. But in his governance of this world, he still appropriately brings consequence to sin because if he didn't bring consequence to sin, Mm -hmm. we would be inclined to simply repeat it and therefore possibly forfeit our lives in the process. Mm -hmm. So the illustration I know I often use, and I know vaccines are controversial today in in their own ways, but when you vaccinate a child, Mm -hmm. you have a parent who brings a child in to the doctor and the child gets stabbed with a little needle and they cry, Mm -hmm. you know, because like, why I trusted you and you brought me in here Mm -hmm. and like that guy's got a weapon and he's stabbing me with it right now and that hurts and why would you do this to me? Well, I don't, I don't want you to die from smallpox, Mm -hmm. you know, like, so I'm gonna allow a little hurt right now to prevent a much bigger hurt later. Mm -hmm. And if we are God's children, you have to assume that some of the things in our lives is he's allowing some hurt now. With the Israelites here, he's allowing some hurt now. Why? To prevent them from much bigger hurt in the long run. Mm -hmm. Do you think that, okay, so they went up on this mountain and it was less than 40 days before they didn't see or hear from God. So they decided to do something else. Do you think that when Jesus left, when he was resurrected and he went back up to heaven, he said, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit to be with you? It's because people have a track record of unless they have God with them all the time, they forget who he is. Yeah. It's a good thought. The fact that he only waits 10 days to send his spirit, he doesn't test his disciples think- beyond that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, it's it's... Got, there's probably a correlation there. He knew what they needed. He also promised that the Spirit was going to come. Um, but that, that, that very clearly he gives them assurances, I'm not going to leave you alone. Mm-hmm. I'm not going to leave you to do this by yourself. Truly, the Israelites weren't totally alone. Like, they actually they had still had God. They had, well, they had Aaron um, oh, even yeah. there, down there. And, as, and they were standing, they were literally by Mount Sinai. Mm-hmm. So they still recognized God's presence up on the mountain. Uh, Mm -hmm. in a sense too. So he was never really gone, but they weren't experiencing it the way that they wanted. Mm -hmm. And so I think, yes, the Spirit's um, presence, Mm -hmm. when when Jesus sends the Spirit, the fact that we know we have his presence and he lives and dwells in us and we experience some of God when a fellow believer, Mm -hmm. you know, encourages us, prays with us, whatever, like God knows we need that. Mm -hmm. And so that's what he gives us. So yeah, I think that's a good, good observation. Thank you. Yeah. All right, should we close with prayer? Mm -hmm. Heavenly Father, we all struggle with our own idolatry. Uh, It's maybe not as overt and obvious as the Israelites here in Exodus 32, but um, we have things that times when we don't trust you the way that we should, and we start trusting uh, things of this world more than we should. uh, And that's idolatry, a subtle form of it that eventually makes us spiritually sick in our own ways. Please forgive us of that. Uh, Please help us to recognize your presence, experience your presence, trust your word in a way that we would never be tempted to uh, look to the things of this world to give us what only you can give us. Lord, uh, keep our eyes focused on you for every good thing. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thanks again for studying with us. We will see you tomorrow for Exodus 32.